is everywhere and it can do so many things, but much of it is untested. However, that hasn't stopped people from using it. Even for mental health guidance, about a third of Americans say they would be comfortable using an AI chatbot as a therapist. And more than half of young people agree. That's according to a poll by YouGov last year. Now, chatbots are a wealth of knowledge, but they aren't human. So is AI therapy helping or is this all just a big experiment? Heather and Kelly are tackling this in a very special Tech Talk. Yeah, it's an important conversation we have to have and we are joined right now by licensed psychologists Dr. Katie Stewart and Dr. Jessica Lani, Associate Professor of Communications at the University of Pittsburgh Greensburg. And Dr. Jess, I want to start with you because I think that there could be people watching right now and you are the lucky ones who aren't very <laughs> sure what an AI chatbot is. So what, what yeah. would you describe it as? So so I think there's, you know, an understandable lack of AI literacy because it's an emerging technology. It's always changing. Mm -hmm. And a chatbot is basically a technology that's been coded to engage with a user. Um, it's, it uses mathematical formulae based off of a large language model, so trained off of large amounts of like books and articles and often copywritten material that is contested as to whether or not it's allowed to be trained with that. And then um, you give it a prompt as a human, and the AI uses that probability formula to put out a response that is likely to be a kind of human response. Okay, interesting. Likely being the, the hard <laughs> word there. And Dr. Stewart, why would someone turn to chatbot? I mean, I, I know that you probably hate this so much. <laughs> a lot of me really, really, really hates, hates this. this. Yes. But, but, but we are hearing about mm -hmm. younger people who are turning yeah. to this. And my first thought is, are they embarrassed to be open with somebody else about the problems they're experiencing, whatever it might be? Yes. But outside of that, why, why else? Why so, would somebody do this? I think there is, that is one reason, right? And we have to say that people using it do report that they feel that they're not gonna be judged like they would with a human being. But then we have availability, which is a huge issue. In the past year, about half of young Americans between 18 and 25 who had mental health needs received no services. And a lot of that is availability of clinicians. Sure. Then you also have, you know, take for example, someone's having a panic attack at 2 a.m. Typically, you cannot call or text right. your therapist, and especially not one you don't have a relationship with, at 2 right. a.m. and say, hey, I need help. So they can do this on demand and then also it's free at this point. Yeah. Most people have at least some sort of copay or they're paying for their insurance yes. that enables them to go to therapy. It's yeah. so true. Now I'm thinking, okay, yeah, someone's therapist isn't available in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Could these two things ever supplement each other? Be the AI chatbot and a human therapist. Do you think that these things could ever work in tandem or sh is it just toxic altogether to go to a computer for human-based therapy. Ugh. So human-based therapy is the key there, right? I, I, I do not think we should be attempting to eliminate humanity from no. therapy because it is a very human interaction. That said, I think that licensed clinicians can work with tech to make therapy bots, which we do not have any FDA-approved therapy bots at this point. Right. I also think that maybe if people are using ChatGPT in certain situations, then they discuss it with their therapist. The therapist could say, hey, here's an appropriate way to do it. Ask, can you give me some grounding techniques that I can use? Can you remind me of what box breathing is? And then it could be useful in these very restricted ways and right. always checking back in with your real life therapist. Therapist, therapist. yes. <laughs> right, well because we don't, the, because there's no regulation, we don't know what kind of advice it would give to somebody and it could in fact turn out to be very dangerous advice mm -hmm. as well. Um, I wanna ask you Dr. Jess, um, what are some signs that chatbot might be leading us astray? Like is there something where if you do ask it a question, you mm -hmm. think it's a harmless question and you think, okay wait, this doesn't seem right. So I think it's really important to understand that these chatbots are coded to be agreeable. They're trying right now to prove their necessity, their use value, so that the companies can say to investors, look at how much people love this. And people love being Aww. flattered. They love an agreeable conversation. So it's difficult, I think, to really put a boundary around what that looks like. It could look like different things for different people in different mental states.
So, th so this feels very much like a first date where they're trying to wow mm -hmm. us over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By third date, we realize, oh, the red flags have been there all along and <laughs> we didn't see them. Okay. Yeah. What a perfect all analogy. Right, right. Wow. All right. I mean, who doesn't love to be right? But yeah. I will tell you, right. yeah. real or bot therapist telling you you're always right, bad idea. Yeah, bad absolutely. idea. Really well, right. Don't go anywhere because next we are talking about what's in place to protect us. So we're going to be right back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Katie Stewart and Dr. Jess Galani talking about the growing use of AI for therapy. We want to know when AI fails, what's in place to protect us? Because really, again, as we were just speaking about, very unregulated right now, and yeah. we're seeing this technology grow faster and faster. So Dr. Jess, what kind of guardrails are in place that we know of? So they vary per chatbot, per tech company that owns the proprietary chatbots. And in most cases, they will, if you talk about um, suicide, for example, they will trigger a response saying, you should call 988, which is the national uh, response line for people who are in crisis. And in other situations, um, you know, that trigger only really works for a lot of the chatbots when the conversation's short and new. And for people who have been chatting for a long time, um, they're arguably more at risk. The AI are less adept at responding to the crisis with guardrails. There are some regulations. There, there's legislation in the pipeline in Pennsylvania, California, and New Jersey to regulate AI chatbot therapy. Um, and some legislation has been passed in a few states, but there still needs to be, I think, regulation of the tech companies themselves. And they are vigorously fighting against that through their AI lobbying efforts. Okay. Absolutely. And Dr. Katie, you know this as a licensed therapist. Mm -hmm. You've talked to all of your clients for probably a lengthy amount of time. Oh, yes. Because whenever you go to therapy, it's also a maintenance thing. It's an mm -hmm. everyday life thing mm -hmm. outside of crisis. Can an AI chatbot really detect if a human is in crisis having very little history? So yes and no. They're actually about on par with humans when it is very high risk, and very low risk. So as Dr. Jess said, if someone says, I'm feeling suicidal, and that's just a blanket statement, they will often say, you need to call 988, or here are some therapists. If someone says, you know what, I've had a really rough day, what's the tallest bridge around me? They don't understand, sure. because what they do not get is subtlety and nuance. And actually, as I said that, I'm like, that didn't actually sound very subtle, but it would to a mm -hmm. machine. Right. So they're good at the extreme ends, but that's not where most people live. That's not how most people are engaging with it. And they're building what feels like relationships. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, interesting. And it's getting missed. And it's just yeah. such a target for just a certain group of people who may be lonely, mm -hmm. or it might be people who use AI chatbots for everyday conversation. I feel like what's so, and I don't want to use the word scary, but for lack of a better term. Use it. It is scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, is. it is. And it, I think that the lack of guardrails and the lack of possible solutions. Dr. Mm -hmm. Dress, are there any in the wheelhouse right now that we can kind of leave on a positive note? I think if we can convince the big tech companies to center the interests of the public mm -hmm. rather than the interests of their investors, then we can get somewhere. But there needs to be a sea change at the industry level because right now they all want to you know, be the unicorn company that makes everybody billionaires rather than be the company that does good in the world. Everybody is trying to put this in every single thing. Yeah. Every single industry, I think, is examining this and how yeah. it could help them. But again, it's the everyday people, everyday life. Yeah. How is this going to impact us? Not just right now, but in 10 years, 20 years, mm. 30 years. Interesting conversation. It I'm is. so glad that we had it today. Thank you Thank both you. for doing this. Uh, we'll link you up to Dr. Jess Galani's Substack newsletter. It's full of great info on technology and culture, exactly what we talked about today, as well as how to book Dr. Katie Stewart. Please do. That's all on our website, katiekcom slash talkpittsburgh, and we'll be right back.